fantastic. I live in uh, Spain uh, the last few years. Yeah, it's good. Is it nice and uh, sunny down there? Yeah, it is now. It has been absolutely terrible weather, but it's getting better. So that lifts the spirits. I mean, we're in our sixth okay. week of lockdown, so it's it's good to, uh, to get some sun. Yep. I um, saw a, a, a meme on uh, Facebook about British weather, and it said um, <clears throat> winter weather, it was appalling, uh, autumn weather, appalling, uh, <laughs> spring weather, appalling, lockdown weather, bright and blue and clear and lovely. And uh, sure yeah. enough, that, that turned out to be exactly true. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> okay, well, we'll just wait for a few people to trickle in. But in the meantime, um, so yeah, hi everyone. This is the follow-up from uh, Vanessa's great talk that's just happened. We've got Professor Andrew Knight, who um, is a professor of animal welfare and ethics and a family director of Central of Animal Welfare, the University of Winchester. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Andrew and he can introduce himself. Uh, thanks very much. I'll try to get my PowerPoint up now. So once I run this, um, I believe I then can't actually see um, anything else on the screen. So Daniel, I don't know if people uh, post comments via a chat column. I'm used to seeing that elsewhere because I won't be able to see any comments if they do come in. What we'll probably do, um, obviously people can post their comments. Um, I don't think there's a way of seeing them if you share your screen maybe there is maybe there's there should be a bottom bit uh a bar at the bottom but if not we can probably come to questions uh, at the end so if, if anyone's got any questions um throughout the presentation if you want to sort of ask them in the chat and we can address them at the end right okay um well i will dive in without further ado um and as i say i unfortunately can't see comments so they'll need to wait until the end if there is any time um, before I, I launch into tonight's topic, I'm going to give a shameless plug to my new study that I've just launched, actually. Um, this is a study trying to examine the health status of uh, dogs and cats maintained on plant-based diets versus meat-based diets and other types of diets, because incredibly, there are almost no studies that have actually explored this so far. So um, here's the link to the study. You can see that hopefully on the screen. If anyone is interested, um, I would love it if they could consider participating and potentially sharing this as well. Uh, there are almost, as I say, no studies that give us any evidence about the health status of cats and dogs maintained on plant-based diets. So this is going to be pretty much the first of its kind. So it's really important that I get enough uh, people to participate to make the results valid. So um, I'd really love it if anyone could consider contacting me through my website if they think they can help me to get that study link out there because it's super important. Thank you. Um, so that's what I've been working on today. Um, but what we're here to talk about, of course, is humane teaching methods within veterinary and other biomedical education. Now, I've been involved in uh, animal advocacy for uh, an unbelievably long period of time, uh, going back around about 30 years, I think, to be honest. Um, and I am from Australia. You can clearly tell by my accent I'm not <laughs> from the UK, I trust. Um, I was um, involved in helping launch the Australian campaign against the live sheep export trade, which was the biggest one uh, in the world in the mid 1990s, actually. And I found it profoundly uh, satisfying to be doing something that I thought would make a difference to really large numbers of, of animals. And I thought, how do I set myself up so I can get a career uh, doing this kind of thing for the rest of my days? And I thought that um, becoming a veterinarian would be a really good way to um, gain the uh, professional qualifications to be taken more seriously by uh, policy makers and society and the media and so on, as well as specialised knowledge about all sorts of animal welfare issues. So I studied really hard um, and managed to get into the uh, veterinary course at West Australia's Murdoch University. And you can see the campus there. Um, we did actually have kangaroos hopping around the uh, forest down the back. Um, and the sky is normally that blue. We don't normally allow clouds. One has strayed into the shot there, unfortunately. So a beautiful campus, as you can see, but uh, it did have a bit of a dark secret, unfortunately, which is that animals were being seriously harmed and killed uh, within the veterinary course. Now, when I entered as um, a, a student seeking to, as I say, become a more effective animal advocate, 
um, I had the vague understanding that harmful animal use was probably going to be uh, required um, somewhere within the degree, although I wasn't sure what that would be. I tried to rationalise to myself that if I was required to harm and kill animals uh, during my education, it would be worthwhile because I'd be able to do so much more good for animals when I um, qualified. So um, <clears throat> I didn't know too much about uh, what animal, animal use would be required, nor about the alternatives that might be available at that time. So I was pretty ignorant, really, when I went into first year of the course. And in the first year in the introductory anatomy and biology uh, classes, we would dissect animals such as um, basically snails, slugs, earthworms, um, body parts from abattoirs, uh, rats. And for some odd reason, there was a bit of an obsession with lampreys for, let say, reasons that were never made clear to us. Lampreys apparently are biologically quite interesting. So um, I tried not to think too much about where all these body parts were coming from. They would typically appear on sort of uh, plastic dissection trays, uh, pinned out, uh, partially dissected or, or just, just specific organs, um, not looking too much like the living animals that they had come from. And for some reason that was fairly effective in helping me to avoid seriously thinking about the issue. But this uh, suddenly came to a, a crashing halt at the end of uh, first year when a particular cell, bio cell biology lab class uh, came up. And in this class, the animals were not already dead. They were appearing uh, alive, the rats were alive, and they were going to be killed uh, by demonstrators just prior to the commencement of the class so that we students could dissect out the still living intestinal tracts and drop those into different uh, solutions to measure the uptake of glucose by the living intestinal cells. So the fact that the rats were still alive just prior to the commencement of this class succeeded in breaking through my fog of denial, which had been so effective in helping me to not uh, think seriously about the issue up until that time. And I was pretty sure that uh, there had to be alternatives available to uh, this sort of class. Uh, these scientific principles had been well known for many decades. Surely we didn't need to kill rats to uh, have those demonstrated to us or to be able to understand them. So I went to my instructors and I said, look, um, I didn't want to participate in this class. Could I please have a, a humane alternative? Um, unfortunately, on this particular occasion, the instructors were hostile to the concept of humane alternatives. Uh, my request was denied. I went on to boycott the lab class, uh, which uh, cost me a grade in that particular course because I ended up getting zero for the lab. However, this was um, extremely good because it stirred up enormous controversy. No one had boycotted anything for years at university. And some students um, were supportive of my position, some were opposed, some faculty were supportive, and some were opposed. And it, it caused enormous discussion. And because of all this controversy, uh, the lab was actually dropped uh, entirely from the course the following year, uh, supposedly for financial reasons, but actually I think because of the controversy. That ended up saving around about 40 rats per year. So I was delighted and it was well worth uh, losing grade uh, four. There was one particular point though where I was called into the offices of the people in charge of this cell biology lab. And they spent two hours trying to cross-examine me and change my views about this matter. And they gave me dire warnings that what I'd seen so far was only the tip of the iceberg compared to what I was gonna have to do to animals later in the veterinary course. And they said, perhaps I should reconsider my choice of career. Well, um, this did cause me to go away and, and uh, reconsider things, but not to reconsider my choice of career. It made me very motivated to go and learn properly about um, what I was talking about. So that if I was in a meeting like that for another two hours with any more academics, then I would really know what the alternatives were, what the courses were around the world where they were being successfully used, and what the educational evidence was showing that students using these alternatives generally uh, learn at least as well as those that learn from harming animals. So I went away and studied to learn those things. And um, I want to share with you now some of what I learned. So humane teaching methods, um, what are they um, at university and secondary level? Alternatives to harming animals consist of these sorts of things, high quality uh, videos, um, 
computer simulations of um, either animal dissections or animal experiments, the use of ethically sourced cadavers, um, so that is uh, bodies obtained from animals that have died naturally or in accidents or been euthanized for medical reasons and donated for teaching purposes, just like with a human body donation program. Uh, body parts from uh, some of these that may have been permanently preserved, meaning that animals don't need to be killed every year to source body parts. Non-invasive self-experimentation upon uh, oneself and one's fellow classmates. This actually occurs in um, some medical courses to demonstrate basic physiological concepts, such as popping students onto exercise bikes and measuring heart rate. Uh, clinical and surgical skills models and simulators. I'll show you some of those uh, shortly. And supervised clinical and surgical experiences as well. So these are the sorts of categories of alternatives and I'll, I'll go in and show you what some of these look like in a minute. That have been developed for all sorts of harmful animal use, uh, particularly in life and health sciences education. And we're talking about uh, anatomy, looking at uh, animal dissections, we're talking about demonstration experiments on living animals in uh, courses like biochemistry, physiology, pharmacology, toxicology. Uh, we're talking about the learning of uh, surgical skills as well by veterinary students um, in particular. So the traditional way that students have uh, learnt surgery in most countries around the world, although oddly and to its credit, not the United Kingdom for many decades now, the traditional way in most places is that students practice a surgical procedure on a healthy animal and then unfortunately the animal is, is killed under anesthesia um, in order that they can practice surgical techniques. So um, as I say, I'll show you what the alternatives are to these sorts of things. With respect to computer simulations of animal dissections, there are really large numbers of those available now. Um, there are one or two um, upsetting pictures of dissected animals appearing in this presentation and one of them is about to come up now so if you don't want to see that just just look away um, here's here's that, that that picture the the point about this is that this is a pro section it's a professionally performed dissection in which you can very clearly see the internal organs it's possible to to do these and to um, take high quality photographs of them and then to display them uh, to students when students do dissections, they tend to accidentally mash up and destroy all of those fragile internal organs, making it really difficult to get any learning value from that dissection thereafter. So high quality photographs of professionally performed dissections can be used permanently and are much, uh, often much clearer in helping students to see the different body parts. Computer simulations of dissections can include those, but also these um, <clears throat> microscopic or histopathological uh, slides. So you can see that the microscopic st structure of tissues in different regions, such as the intestines here, and how it varies uh, from that in other regions, such as, uh, say, say the, the skin. So that's not something you can see with a real dissection. Here's another one of those upsetting pictures, and there's a few more of them coming up. But this is a fantastic alternative. This was basically a uh, permanently preserved uh, dissected dog's head uh, made available from the uh, Colorado Vet School via their online simulation. It's possible for students uh, to uh, go onto their computer, select the particular body part that they need to learn about. In this case, the head has been chosen to choose either the, to study the bony anatomy or the soft tissue anatomy or the radiographic anatomy. So that's the x-rays of different body parts or the clinical anatomy, that's the, the anatomy of, of the live dog that a, a, a veterinary student or a veterinarian uh, might need to feel or palpate or examine uh, when a dog is, is alive. So let's say a student had, has chosen the soft tissue anatomy. So it's possible to then go and look at all the different parts of the head. For in, any particular part, it's possible to choose a particular structure, in this case, the masseter to muscle, and learn the basic things that uh, medical and veterinary students need to learn about all of these muscles, which is the anatomical origin of the muscle, the uh, point of insertion of the muscle, uh, the action that the muscle performs, and the nerve supply to the muscle. So all that information about the muscles is available here in the sidebar. You can zoom in and look at things more closely. You can uh, drag a slider button across the screen and actually rotate. Uh, 
the head, you can roll it smoothly and look at it from different angles, and not jerkily like I'm doing here, but actually smoothly in the real simulation. You can look at the, uh, as I say, the X-ray anatomy, the radiographic anatomy, learning about clinically important regions, such as the frontal sinuses of the skull here. You can learn about clinically important structures, such as the veins underneath the tongue here. Uh, the glottis, this is um, where you would pass um, uh, a tube for uh, intubation of a dog. If you're uh, connecting it to an anaesthetic gas machine, this, this tube will pass down into the trache trachea or the airway of the dog, and so on. You can do these same sorts of things for human beings as well. Um, this is uh, the face simulation of a, a human head. Uh, created by a medical illustrator at the University of uh, Ohio. And basically what you can do is you can drag a slider button across the screen and melt the uh, tissue layers away, starting off uh, at, at the skin, going all the way down to the bone. And then by dragging the button in the opposite direction, all the tissue layers reappear. So you're seeing a whole host of uh, functions here that uh, you can get with these um, simulations of dissections that you can't get from uh, dissecting essentially um, a, a body part on a dissecting table. You can't replace all the uh, tissues once you've removed them. Uh, you can't see uh, the, what, what the muscles actually do and things like that. In this particular simulation, if, if the student actually clicks upon this uh, red muscle here, it will make the muscle actually contract and you'll see what the muscle does. And in this case, it causes the nose to twitch. So again, not something you would see in a real dissection. If you did, you'd probably be worried about uh, 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 zombies or something like that. But normally uh, pieces of, um, of body part don't start moving around and demonstrating their functions on a dissecting table. So you can get a lot more functionality. Here's um, another simulation of frogs. Frogs are the species, one of the species most commonly dissected at high school level. Um, this uh, allows you to look at different parts. You can go into the dissection itself. You can look at diagrams of functional anatomy. You can learn about the ecology of the frog as well. So let's look at some of those. Here's the dissection part. Students will have to initially go to a virtual toolbox and select the correct equipment, such as the scalpel and uh, forceps to hold the frog properly. They'll need to drag them across the virtual frog in the appropriate positions. And if they do that correctly, they'll see a video play of a frog being dissected. And the ethics of this you know, are questionable. Um, if it was a frog that has been killed just for teaching purposes, then that's a problem. But at least the video clip is now being used indefinitely hereafter saving frogs being killed every year. Or it might not be a frog that was killed uh, for teaching purposes. It might have been a naturally dead frog, in which case um, that ethical problem has been removed. But either way, you can get the video clip and you can uh, see the, the picture of the actual dissection occurring if the student has set the experiment up properly. With the uh, diagrams of the functional anatomy, by clicking on the right button, you'll see the red arterial blood uh, flowing through the appropriate chambers of the frog heart um, and the blue uh, venous blood doing the same thing. Uh, it looks pretty cool when you see it actually pumping and, and moving. And again, this is another example of something you can't get with a traditional uh, dissection of a real frog. When you click on the ecology part, you can learn about the ecology of a frog. And if you click on this here, this little uh, sound button, you, you'll hear what the frog sounds like. And when I've given this presentation to large audiences in conference halls, I've tried to uh, do a personal demonstration of the croaking of, of a frog. And it's always gone really badly. So I'm not going to, to try to do that now. But it is available in the simulation. So that's... Um, computer simulations of um, dissections. Another source is using real uh, body parts uh, and real animals, but not those that have been killed just for teaching purposes, those that have been ethically sourced. Ethically sourced, as I said, comes from animals that have died naturally or in accidents or been euthanized for medical reasons and donated for teaching purposes. Um, once those body parts uh, are available, you can then permanently preserve them in different ways to prevent the need for animals being sourced every single year. So this is um, a somewhat younger me in our anatomy museum. All veterinary schools pretty much have them. 
these giant rooms full of permanently preserved body parts. This is um, a horse's head uh, in sections where the uh, sections have been preserved in pots. They're potted specimens con containing formaldehyde or other powerful chemical preservatives that permanently preserve these body parts and also have chemicals designed to uh, retain the colours. It's possible to uh, plastinate um, specimens such as this squid here via a procedure that involves removing all the uh, fat and, and a lot of the uh, water from the tissues and replace, replacing them with an um, epoxy resin. This involves several chemical steps and the use of a vacuum. And it results in the uh, structure being permanently preserved and having a, a faint sort of a plasticky uh, whiff. It's possible also to uh, perfuse major vessels um, of organs, such as this cow's kidney here, with uh, coloured dyes. Um, whilst the animal is under general anaesthesia um, before it um, is killed or is euthanized if it's got a medical problem. Um, and then it's possible to dissolve away the soft tissues around these uh, colored dyes uh, using mild acid over several months, leaving just casts of the blood vessels. You can also do this with airways. This is, um, sorry, th this is a, a blood vessel cast of a liver and gallbladder of a dog. And this is the airways of the lungs. Um, uh, within, uh, again, uh, a dog. So it's possible to permanently preserve organs in a variety of ways, and even the largest imaginable animals have been successfully preserved. This is the plastinated elephant, standing by uh, Gunther von Hagen. He's the anatomist who invented this plastination uh, method. And he now has, uh, at last count, um, I understood four traveling exhibitions of plastinated animals that tour the world and one uh, traveling exhibition of plastinated humans, people who have also died and, and donated their bodies for use in teaching and exhibitions. So the same thing has been, has been done to them. They've been plastinated as well. If anyone hasn't been to one of these exhibitions and you ever get the opportunity, it looks a bit macabre looking at it, but it's actually extremely interesting. Um, he has a very good uh, display showing uh, what all the different uh, muscles do and the different body parts do and it's, it's extremely interesting to learn about the function of all of the different anatomical parts and I particularly enjoyed the great big uh, message at the very front of the London Natural History Museum display stating that no animals had been killed or harmed for this exhibition they had all been sourced from animals that have died naturally uh, and so on so that was uh, really good to see as well. This is um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Uh, Brioni Dixon, who is, uh, well, is, is from Australia as well, from Queensland Vet School, uh, I believe working uh, as a vet in the UK now. Uh, and she is practicing placing a chest tube within the uh, chest of a dog, um, which is something you might do if a dog presents following a road traffic accident with collapsed lungs, collapsed because either air has gotten into the lung space or blood has gotten into the lung space from internal bleeding and the lungs have collapsed. So to treat that, you need to get that air or that blood out of there. So you need to place a chest tube and be able to draw that out using a syringe. So to learn the procedure of doing this, uh, which is a life-saving technique, she's actually practicing uh, not on um, a healthy animal that's been um, donated for this purpose, but on, on a cadaver of an animal that's been euthanized for medical reasons and then donated for teaching purposes in her veterinary school. So that was ethically sourced cadavers. Now, what about computer simulations of experiments? Well, early experiments, uh, sorry, early computer simulations were criticized for being not very realistic. And you can see why when you look at this simplistic uh, picture of an animal experiment going on. Of course, these are different from dissections. Dissection always involves cutting into something that, that's dead. An experiment always involves doing something to an animal that's that's alive to demonstrate scientific concepts. So the more modern computer simulations, however, are much more realistic and will include um, video clips of uh, people actually undertaking experimental procedures, uh, video clips of animals that have been affected uh, by those procedures. And again, not all of those have been uh, ethically sourced, unfortunately, but at least it means that the animals no longer need to go through those procedures every single year. 
Um, they may include virtual uh, equipment that the student needs to set up, such as a virtual oscilloscope here, virtual electrodes. Uh, a student may need to, for example, dissect a virtual frog's hind leg, place uh, the virtual frog sciatic muscle across these electrodes, apply an electric uh, current to them, and, and watch the response on the oscilloscope as the muscle hopefully twitches. This is an experiment that's very common. Uh, my veterinary student class had to actually do this, this kind of experiment. Um, and here's a simulation being developed to provide an alternative for using real frogs. And a pretty realistic um, virtual uh, bench top that's been set up for students to use there. There are a host of models available. Um, so these are uh, some fairly simplistic models for teaching uh, primary and high school students in this particular case here. There seem to be quite a lot of models of rodents in particular to teach laboratory technicians how to take blood samples from rats because of course rodents are the most common animals used and taking blood is something that's very common that people need to learn how to do when they're working in laboratories. There are more advanced uh, mannequins for clinical skills training. This here is uh, Critical Care Jerry. Jerry is a dog mannequin. Uh, you can uh, perfuse him with uh, fake blood solution and practice, practice taking blood draws. You can practice uh, placing an endotracheal tube, that is a tube down the airway for connecting to an anesthetic gas machine. You can um, basically practice listening for normal and abnormal heart sounds and breath sounds and feeling for a pulse. All of these things can be controlled by an instructor and students can learn from them and even be tested on some of these mannequins. Uh, other ones exist now as well, even sort of bigger ones for practicing uh, rescuing horses that have fallen into ditches and, and, and other, other interesting mannequins. Here's uh, Brioni again, uh, practicing in this case, uh, doing learning to do CPR on critical care Jerry. Here is Brioni again, this time at the Royal Veterinary College uh, in, uh, well, just outside of London, uh, one of the world's leading vet colleges. And she's practicing bovine rectal palpation. So this is uh, putting a gloved arm inside a cow's bottom to figure out um, if they're pregnant or not, or what stage of pregnancy they're at. It's a pretty disgusting thing to have to do. Uh, and it's something that's really common for farm animal vets uh, working with dairy farmers, because of course, to produce milk, the cows need to get pregnant. Uh, it's cr critically important that they do so. And farmers are very concerned to find out if they are pregnant and what stage of pregnancy they're at. Um, if they don't produce a calf, they don't produce milk and they're not an economic unit for the farm. So this is really important. So vet students need to learn how to do this. So in this case, she's using uh, a simulator. Now this is a haptic simulator. Uh, basically it is a sort of a sewing thimble on the end of a robotic arm, which is then attached to a computer simulation. And the simulation applies pressure to the student's fingertips, which is anatomically appropriate depending upon where the student's fingers are inside the simulation. And the simulation can be set up to be uh, to have no fetus, not pregnant, nothing there, or advanced pregnancy or any other state of pregnancy, normal or pathological. So the simulation can be programmed. And the, the instructor can see on a screen over here, which could be hidden from the student behind uh, a, a, a board, uh, where the student actually is inside the simulation. So that's called haptic technology. Um, and apart from this cow model, these have been developed for horses uh, where veterinarians need to do the same thing to diagnose cases of colic, which is abdominal pain and can be caused by all sorts of things, including twisted intestines. Uh, and also there's been one developed for cats. Uh, vets need to simply be able to feel the outside of a cat's tummy uh, as part of their normal physical examination of cats. So simulation has been made for that as well. So quite a number of, of these now. As you can imagine, they're expensive. They cost thousands of, of pounds. What if um, you are at a veterinary school where you can't afford thousands of pounds? These photos were taken uh, from Thailand where local craftspeople uh, were paid um, to develop 
wooden carvings which um, simulate these soft, flexible rubber uh, simulations of a dog's head. Uh, now, the soft, flexible rubber ones are great for practicing passing uh, tubes down into the airway and doing, doing other things, but they're pretty expensive. These wooden ones, of course, are not flexible, so they're not as useful, but they're affordable in the local economy. And students can still be taught some things, at least uh, appropriate uh, handling and restraint. Um, they can be used to demonstrate how to give a, a pill uh, to, to dogs and so on. So there's still some, some things that can be done. What about uh, veterinary surgical training? Because as I said before, the traditional way of teaching surgery is in most places in the world, students would practice a surgical procedure on a healthy animal and then unfortunately kill them uh, before they recover consciousness from the anesthesia. So um, alternatives to this ideally comprise three stages. In the first stage, students um, learn basic instrument handling and manual skills by using models such as knot tying boards, plastic organs and other models. I'll show you some of those in a moment. Secondly, they progress to simulating a surgical procedure on an ethically sourced cadaver. And thirdly, they will need to uh, assist with surgery on real patients. Just the same way that uh, human surgeons are trained. They start by observing surgery, then they assist with it under direct one-to-one -one supervision, and they will be performing surgical procedures under that close supervision. Now, shelter animal sterilization programs are extremely popular in this respect. This is where homeless animals are taken from shelters to a veterinary school, undergo spays or castrations, and return for adoption. These are extremely popular because they benefit all parties, really. They benefit the uh, animal shelter by providing this um, uh, surgical service to them. Um, the animals don't go on and, um, and, and continue to breed after adoption, contributing to pet overpopulation that the shelter is trying to solve in the first place. Uh, the students get experience at one of the most important surgical procedures they'll need to know how to do as new graduates. And I should say that veterinary students get um, quite stressed about this. Um, the castration is a relatively easy surgical procedure, but the spay operation, the removal of the uh, uterus and the ovaries from a female dog or a cat, for example, is a major surgical procedure, even though it's one of the most common surgical procedures that, that occur in veterinary practice. It's still a major surgical procedure, and um, it's quite a big undertaking for a new graduate to be performing but they're expected, nevertheless, um, to be competent um, at performing these, these procedures pretty quickly after they start uh, work as in veterinary practice. So it's extremely stressful for students. They know that if they make uh, any serious mistakes, their patients could die. And, uh, so uh, they really appreciate the chance to practice uh, this procedure under close one-to-one -one supervision and support before graduating. So these animal shelter uh, neutering programs benefit all parties and they're very, very popular. This is an example of a basic model. This is called the DAISY, the Dog Abdominal Surrogate for Instructional Exercises. And it's basically just a, a, series, a foam cylinder with several layers that simulate different tissue layers, such as the skin, the uh, fat layer underneath the skin, the muscles and the internal parts. This particular one's got uh, um, foam intestines. It's got uh, red threads running around the, the inside of the simulation, simulating blood vessels. Um, and a student like me, I actually bought one of these things. They cost uh, 15 US dollars when I was doing this, and they can be reused up to six times each by simply rotating the daisy. So I bought one of these things and I practiced uh, preparing myself. So I had to don all that PPE equipment, personal protective equipment. We're hearing about in the news reports these days about COVID-19. I had to wear the, the uh, gloves, the gown, the mask. I had to drape the patient, um, do everything in a very sterile fashion, uh, extensive scrubbing of my hands. So this, for starters, took me about 20 minutes. Uh, I had to go and blunt dissect my way through the various tissue layers, encountering my red blood vessels here. Here's a blood vessel clamping those uh, so they wouldn't bleed, tying them off, ligating them, cutting through them, going deeper, pulling out my foam intestines, wetting it down with saline solution so they wouldn't dry out, all the things that you need to do in a real surgery. 
Uh, then the students can practice removing sections of intestine and, and whoops, tying them back together. They can practice removing foreign bodies from intestines. And when they're finished, closing everything back, back up again. Um, so I did all of that and it took me around about three hours, can you believe, uh, to do all that on the DAISY when I was a student. And that uh, period of time is actually uh, pretty common for students doing surgical labs anyway. They can actually go to five hours quite, quite easily. So an amazingly beneficial range of experience that I wouldn't have wanted to be practicing the first time on a real animal, to be honest. It's uh, very helpful to use these basic simulations, even if they're not completely realistic, to get a good basis of experience and skill before you progress to a real animal. Here's a bunch of surgical uh, simulators. This is uh, plastic uh, soft tissue models, uh, which can be useful. These are examples of bones. These are sore bones. They um, can be produced uh, both normally and with increased fragility to simulate osteoporosis. Uh, and they can come with a, a range of standard fractures or custom made fractures uh, to allow the practice of orthopedic procedures such as fracture repairs. And they're available for use by medical students and by veterinary students as well. Going even more advanced, we have this thing down here. This is a pulsating organ perfusion trainer or a POP trainer. And it's possible to get major organs from bodies, um, whether they're ethically sourced cadavers or whether they come from abattoirs, and put them inside this. Basically, this is just a big plastic um, bin, essentially connect up the major blood vessels in these organs to a circuit containing uh, fluid, which is actually simulated blood. And if you put a pump in there, you can send a pulse through it um, at a regular basis. And all of a sudden you have a simulation now, which does actually bleed if you cut it in the wrong place. And if you do that and it bleeds, you can then practice uh, controlling hemorrhage, controlling bleeding in a surgical patient. Now, most simulations don't allow you to do that. So this is pretty advanced to be able to practice a control of bleeding in a surgical patient. Now you can practice your surgical procedure using conventional surgical approaches or minimally invasive surgical approaches. Minimally invasive is where you basically cut usually three tiny holes, one tiny hole for a camera to go inside uh, uh, along with a light. Uh, putting a display of the interior up on the screen in front of the surgeon and another couple of tiny holes for the insertion of basically a scalpel and some forceps. So that's minimally invasive surgery. So there are just three tiny holes on the surface of the patient. Either way, you can practice surgical technique um, using this kind of simulation. This is a picture I took when I was a first year student. So I was behind the camera. Here we have a uh, senior veterinary student assisting uh, the actual surgeon with spinal surgery on a dog. And of course, this is the uh, most important part of surgical training. Everything else really just leads up to this. Uh, most important part is actually uh, participating in beneficial surgeries on real patients under close one-to-one -one supervision. Here's an extremely cool surgical simulator. Um, this actually um, allows a surgeon to control um, these robotic arms, which are then basically linked to uh, what could be a patient up here on an operating table in the same room, or perhaps even in a different room on the other side of the world, potentially, which throws up all sorts of interesting issues. Um, or simply connected to a simulation on a screen. Here's some heart surgeries going on. So there are some wonderful video clips showing some of these surgical simulators in action. Here's an example of a real alternative veterinary surgical program. This is one that um, I created with a friend when I was a surgical student um, in uh, our surgical school, our veterinary school uh, in, in Australia. And we, um, <clears throat> basically our, our surgical instructors were opposed to the idea of uh, a humane surgical program. So we had to go over their heads and essentially um, get the university to uh, agree to provide, to allow us to set up an alternative surgical program. Um, and that's a whole other story, which is really, really interesting, involved uh, national media exposure of what was going on at the university, the initiation of legal action against the university. But it had a really good ending because the university then agreed quite rightly 
to make reasonable efforts to provide alternatives for students that didn't want to harm animals in their training. So the surgery faculty didn't like this. They said, well, you forced us to allow this, so we'll allow it, but we're not going to help you. You're going to have to go and set up your own alternative surgical program. And then you need to bring some animals back to the university and do some surgeries on them, say from animal shelters. And if you can't do them to our standards, we're going to fail you. <laughs> so that was a bit of a challenge. So we um, basically set up a program, uh, myself and one other student, ourselves, that involved going to external clinics and uh, getting them to allow us to assist in beneficial surgery uh, and anesthesia on, on real patients. We had to bring real patients to the university uh, from animal shelters. And we also had to attend all of the terminal surgical labs that were still going on with all the rest of the students where they were practicing surgical procedures on uh, young pigs and also on uh, sheep. I also bought the DAISY model and did some surgical simulations on, on that. And we also, oh yes, hello. Apologies, Dennis. just to, just, sorry to interrupt. Um, is there any way you can open the slide into like a full presentation? Because at the moment it's in presenter view. Um, I, I don't think uh, there is. Can you guys, um, are you guys? If you, I think if you press U slideshow just at the top. I've got two screens happening here for some reason. Um, U slideshow, jolly good. Let's see, we see what that does. There yeah, we there we go. Sorry, thank okay. you. There we go. Great. Cheers. Could you guys only see part of the screen before, could you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, All right. Uh, anyway, so, right, where were we? Yeah, um, ethically sourced cadaver surgery. So we did actually um, get a couple of animals that were being euthanized for medical reasons. So they were placed under general anesthesia and we then performed some uh, abdominal orthopedic surgeries on them. So the results were that we didn't have to participate as surgeon or assistant surgeon in at most uh, 13 scheduled surgeries. Um, but we ended up performing or assisting with a total um, of at least, I think, about uh, four times as many surgeries. Um, I can't actually see all of my text anymore. Can you guys actually see the text at the right hand side or do you see a bunch of people on screens on the right hand side so we see the presentation um okay. Interesting. if you need that for your notes though obviously feel free to switch back let's see if i can um i'm not sure how to get rid of that so i can see my own screen oh well um i guess i will try to try to go back to be honest because i can't can't see my screen very well this way. If you press escape, you should be able to come out of it. Hmm, not, not working. Sorry about this. That's all right. Uh, maybe I think in the bottom left, bottom left, the uh, that one, it might be uh, okay. the, the screen. Hmm. Yes, sorry, H how did we get back to where we were before? Um, what did you ask me to do to, to get here? So if you um, if you press the, the, in the bottom left corner, I think if you press the, the, the square, there's a button that looks like a square. Actually, I've, I've managed to um, get rid of the, the wonderful list of people. Now I can actually see my screen by oh, clicking, clicking something else. So I'll just carry on. Cool. Anyway, so this, this is what the outcomes were. So we ended up um, actually being involved in about five times as many surgeries as our classmates, and they perform mostly under supervision in private practice. Uh, as I said, the spay operation is the, the one that um, most students worry about uh, because they really need to be able to do that uh, pretty quickly after they graduate, and it's a major surgical procedure. Most veterinary students get about one to two spays before they graduate. If they're lucky, they get more than that. If they're unlucky, they won't even get a full spay. They might get a half a spay. We jointly did 21 spays between two of us before we even entered our final year of our program. And we did a whole bunch of castrations as well. We also participated in a wide range of other surgical procedures too. And we got a lot of anesthetic experience as well. And unlike our 
classmates, we also got to see the animals initially present. We got to see the examinations of them, diagnostic testing, learn about the history of them, go through the surgery, and then follow them through with the post-operative recovery. So our classmates didn't get any of that experience. So we had a much superior um, surgical training experience, to be honest. Now, um, in 2013, I went here. This is one of the world's largest veterinary schools, and it's on the Caribbean island of St. Kitts. This is Ross University. Um, I'll, I'll use this as an excuse to briefly show you a few gorgeous slides. This is the temporary combination they put me into when I first arrived. Uh, I went there to teach um, veterinary surgical clinical skills. This is the traffic I had to deal with going back and forth in front of my windows. Uh, I had some unexpected guests, as you can see there. And this was our, our veterinary school itself. So um, this is the, the main sort of area that the students would, would use. This is one of the lunchtime cafes they would use while overlooking the Caribbean Sea. So it was absolutely gorgeous. Um, in time, I got put into some more permanent accommodation. This was the view that I had. And this was the communal swimming pool that um, we had in our in our block. <laughs> so, so pretty, pretty amazing time. But sadly, I didn't get uh, very much time to actually use it because we spent most of our time working incredibly hard. The students would email back home complaining that uh, they had white skin because they could never get to the beach because they had spending all their time in the library, uh, which was pretty much true. Um, so I was the director of the clinical skills lab and we would teach our students surgical and clinical skills starting in semester one uh, and building every semester all the way through until the end of our surgical course. And we would use models, mannequins and simulators exactly as I've described. Our students had a reputation for being some of the best prepared students surgically when they went to US mainland schools to do their final clinical year. We recently, with a colleague, I recently published um, a, an academic paper on how to set up a clinical skills lab using uh, these sorts of models, mannequins and simulators uh, uh, for anyone else that wants to do the same kind of thing. Most veterinary schools have done this now, but uh, nevertheless, I hope it might be useful to anyone that still needs to. Now, how effective are all these humane teaching methods? I wanna to touch on this briefly. I've actually um, studied this and published this in my own book and various articles. Basically, I looked at a series of educational studies comparing student learning outcomes when they, the students used humane teaching methods versus harmful animal use. Um, there are 12 of these, uh, at least, that have described 11 distinct studies of vet students. Nine of those assessed surgical training, and that's important because this is the discipline involving the greatest harmful animal use. The humane method resulted in superior learning outcomes about 45% of the time. So that is superior skill or the same level of skill in a shorter time frame, which is safer for a patient. The equivalent learning outcomes about 45% of the time and inferior outcomes about 9% of the time. Don't bother trying to actually read this slide too well. It really just shows the sort of uh, alternatives that have been considered in these studies. Ethically sourced cadavers, interactive video discs, soft tissue organ models, plastic models, and so on. Surgical skills assessed were psychomotor skills, that sort of instrument handling and coordination skills, tying off blood vessels, intestinal surgeries, stomach surgeries, ovarian hysterectomy, that's a spay operation. Most studies examine short-term learning outcomes, but there was one that looked at the competence of graduates at the time of hiring as new graduates and also one year in the future. And in this particular study, it was found that there's no significant differences in the two groups of students in their abilities to perform common surgical and other procedures, the attitude towards performing surgery, whether they were confident or not really, or their ability to perform without assistance. So there you go, um, no significant difference there, even over the long term. Now, what about um, non-surgical disciplines? Cardiovascular physiology was found to be learned more efficiently using interactive video discs. Microbiology students uh, had more active learning, greater autonomy using databases with images, movies, and sounds. Bovine rectal palpation was learned more effectively um, using haptic uh, simulations. Equine nasogastric intubation was learned more effectively using a CD-ROM. 
when you look at all educational um, studies, not just veterinary students now, but all um, disciplines across their life and health sciences, and even down to high school biology, you find that there's about 33 papers and you get similar results. You get superior outcomes about 40% of the time with the humane method, equivalent about 50% of the time and inferior about 9% of the time. So um, I'm probably running out of time. I don't really prefer to allow people time to ask a little bit of so questions if, if they have any. So I think what I'm going to do is just skip through to just... Um, there's some really fascinating stuff here about what harmful animal usage actually does to students that participate in it, which I don't have time to talk about. But for anyone that um, is interested in sourcing these studies and getting advice in, in some detail about steps to follow at their own university, if they need to ask for humane alternatives or launch a campaign about how to get humane alternatives allowed at a university, I've tried to provide all that kind of information on my website here humanelearning.info um, and the studies that I mentioned if anyone needs to access those of course you can just contact me through my personal website andrewknight.info and I can send you those or direct them to you. Um, I would like to open up for any questions or comments in I think my last five minutes rather than spend more time um, going through a presentation and as I, say, I can't actually see comments on my screen so I don't know how we do this Daniel so perhaps you can uh, advise us how we deal with any questions or comments yeah cool um so i can let you know there was oh, if anyone wants to ask a question if you want to put it in the chat um we can pitch it to andrew uh there was a question earlier from ic about obviously is there a website with a list of all or the many of these options uh, the question often comes up but i usually have to be pretty vague about the ethical options available and i think that was in reference to some of the uh, the tools that you use uh, to simulate. Yeah, I've, I've provided um, things like short also, YouTube videos and also videos had in the pub chat anyway. publications that um, summarise what all the different options are suitable for presenting to faculty members and so on if anyone needs to do that. Cool. Cool. Um, any more questions? So how far do you think professional bodies are in mandating these humane options? Um, they, they certainly don't mandate the use of humane options uh, in general. Uh, the best you can hope for is that they don't mandate harmful animal use. Uh, and it's, as I say, it's been the case that this kind of harmful animal use has been a part of uh, veterinary curricula, certainly, but also quite commonly other university life and health sciences curricula, and even down to high school biology level as well with, with respect to animal dissections in most parts of the world for a very long period of time. And technically speaking, um, all of the uh, EU nations uh, and, and the United Kingdom um, have got le national legislation uh, requiring use of humane alternatives wherever possible. So technically speaking, all of this uh, harmful animal use is illegal because um, humane alternatives do exist. They have been successfully implemented into other courses around the world. And the vast majority of the educational evidence clearly shows that students using them do at least as well, if not better. So it's clearly not necessary to harm animals in these courses. So um, there's obviously a strong argument to, to be made there that, that that use is not legal. Nevertheless, I don't think anyone's actually really put this forward in the courts. When this has occurred, it's usually been cases of individual students arguing for their personal rights to be allowed to learn without calming animals. So it comes down to a matter of student rights, civil rights, rather than um, the legal requirement to use alternatives to animals wherever possible. Most of those cases have been successful. Most of them have resulted in universities actually implementing alternatives and usually about 10 years later they've actually dropped the harmful animal use from the curriculum completely. Sydney vet school was an exception there was no 10-year gap they did they got to the end stage in one go um, quite a long time ago now. So I one of the publications I didn't get time to get to was basically about so-called conscientious objection by students it was the the, the jurisprudential basis so the, the, the basis in law and legal philosophy 
whereby um, students should be able to conscientiously object to harmful animal use. That kind of conscientious objection law is in the in most modern democracies to protect people that conscientiously object to military service and various other activities. And you can also apply it to requirements for students to participate in things they find ethically objectionable in their education. So that publication is also available from me. If anyone you know, needs to know what are the legal foundations uh, to exercise their rights, not to harm animals in their courses, uh, I've got all that for them as well. Excellent. Yeah, that's really interesting. So we've got quite a few other questions that have come through. Um, if anyone wants to ask them verbally themselves, feel free to, to engage in the conversation uh, now that we've got a list of the different questions that are coming up. So Saba, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure. I was uh, wanting to know how we can respond to questions around um, animal testing for medicine, particularly now during the time of the virus. Um, yeah, I'm kind of not sure how to respond to that myself, but I think you'd, you'd obviously know much more than me. Sure. So uh, animal testing of new medicines is required in most jurisdictions, but I would argue, and other scientists would argue, who have also done similar studies, that this animal testing doesn't actually help the development of those new medicines uh, very meaningfully, because the animal tests are not very good at predicting human outcomes. Um, animal tests are pretty good at predicting compounds that are toxic in humans. If something is toxic in a human, it will probably come up as toxic in an animal test. The trouble is animal tests are generally not very good at predicting things that are not toxic. So if something is not toxic in humans, it will probably also come up as toxic in the animal test quite often. So if you get a toxic result in an animal test, it doesn't actually tell you very much about whether it's really toxic in a human or not. So animals are just not very predictive for human outcomes with respect to toxicity and quite often other outcomes as well. So yes, they are used, but does that mean that they contributed to the development of those, into, those drugs? I'd say not uh, in a meaningful way. With respect to COVID-19, it's, it's extremely interesting that the vaccines currently under trial in the United Kingdom, I understand, have been rushed straight into human beings without going through the normal animal testing because suddenly there is uh, an urgent public health situation and people are in a, in, a, in a much more of a hurry than they usually are. So let's really hope that those trials are successful. There is a vaccine soon. Uh, one useful side effect of that would be that it would show that animal testing is, is not necessary in a way that it's, it's usually been thought to be necessary. Daniel, I, I, don't, I don't want to hold people up if, um, if people need to go. I don't know if you've got another... Um, well, we've got now. we've got quite a few quite a few questions. Um, if anyone obviously does want to stay for longer, that's that's totally fine. Um, if you want to listen to the questions, I'm happy to carry on. I just don't want to interfere with people's plans if if they now need to you, you okay. need to do another webinar, for example. Um, well, we've got um, one from Giacomo. So, do you want to ask uh, Giacomo? Hi, Giacomo? thank you for your talk. Um, I. I learned that uh, Dr. Neil Barnard and the Physician Committee for Responsible Medicine also opposed animal experimentation. I wanted to know if there were any international organization opposing um, the experimentation and if you were linked to them in any way. Thank you. Okay. Um, there are certainly national organizations in uh, various countries. Uh, there is, um, I believe, a European collaboration as well. Uh, I'm not personally linked. I'm an independent academic uh, with the University of Winchester. Um, so I'm not personally linked. Um, if anyone else would like to suggest those organisations, they can do so. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have good suggestions. I'm sorry. There are some great organisations out there, but, but I'm, I'm not involved with them. Um, and then we've got a question from Mina. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi. Um, hi, I was just um, wondering if you could tell us um, what you would say from your last kind of um, experience with the issue is if there's maybe one or two top points of contention that um, campaigners for humane training still encounter from um, 
from schools, et cetera, if there's, if there's one sticking point that they just can't seem to get around because obviously your um, kind of success statistics are really impressive. So it's, it's very difficult to, you know, it, it's, uh, it's such a strange cognitive dissonance that they wouldn't be able to wrap their heads around that. Um, it, people will usually go on to teach the same way that they were taught and uh, teachers and certainly in the university environment where I currently am, and also at high school level these days are so thinly stretched. There are not enough of them. They don't have enough time. Uh, they don't have enough teaching resources. They really don't have time to go looking uh, into other ways of teaching at all. It's much more a survival situation for the teacher actually. So I can understand they don't have time to go too much beyond their own personal experiences. The, the main problem that they have is, is they don't understand um, that these methods can be effective uh, just as effective and in around about 45% of cases actually even more effective than the traditional methods for imparting knowledge or imparting things like uh, clinical and surgical skills. So that's a real shame. How do we get uh, this educational evidence to these people? I've certainly done my best of the organisations that um, work in this field uh, try as well. Um, the review paper that I mentioned, uh, reviewing all of these studies, bringing together all of that evidence, showing the proportion that produce equivalent and superior learning outcomes and so on, is actually quite old now. Um, and if we were to do the same study today, uh, looking at more modern uh, humane alternatives that have been developed, we probably get even better results for the humane alternatives. So actually with a colleague at the moment, uh, I am trying to, to do um, an updated version of that study. So we should have even better evidence. The evidence that's out there at the moment is already really good. The evidence that, that's coming should be even better. I think it's just a question of how do you get it to uh, these people um, who don't have time to go out there looking for it. It's really a, a question of communication and, and uh, outreaching that information. And that's really where I ask for the help, to be honest, of the entire animal advocacy movement and helping to get out the uh, sort of information that uh, myself and others try to provide because uh, I don't have time, sadly, to, to reach out to all those teachers myself. I very much rely upon uh, the, the movement to do that. Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, a little bit in line with what um, the uh, Cambridge Centre for um, Animal Rights Law are doing kind of, I mean, obviously they, they've got, you know, funding and time to do this, but they've basically put together a whole syllabus and teachers that are interested in starting a program at various universities can come and just pick up the syllabus so they don't have to go through the whole process of creating one. Um, so that's that's obviously like that would that's that would be an amazing thing to be able to do. So hopefully there'll be um, a group that can support you by doing that at some point and just take that forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. Um, so we've got three more questions. Um, if you're okay with the time, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, all good. Great. So we've got a question from um, so we've got Xperia. Don't know what the real name is. Uh, Xperia, Janelle, and then Chantel. Does, who is it that's called Xperia? Well, I, I, can, I can read it out. Um, so yeah, I ditched a zoology course because of the use of animal models 30 years ago. I, object, I objected and got transferred over to psychology just as bad. I tried to train to be an entomologist, very difficult to study humanely, but I searched for help and found nothing. I wonder if scans is a good option for anatomy study of the smaller creatures such as insects, which I still object to subject to dissection. With insects, we probably suggest that students go and try to source naturally dead insects. Um, literally go for a walk and see what you can find. Obviously, you'll only find what's in your local area. Um, and it's going to be difficult if you need um, <clears throat> insects that are not in your local area. But, but that, is, that is the suggestion that would normally be offered. Uh, I suppose one could try to study um, them in museums as well. Um, and then all the, the usual methods, the still images, uh, literally uh, online these days, but previously it would have been in databases. Um, it is going to be harder than uh, studying domesticated species for which there are so many more images and alternatives that have been developed. 
the sorts of experiments I was showing, the demonstration experiments in subjects like physiology and biochemistry, interestingly, there's a, a very, very similar set of experiments that seem to be repeatedly used around the world in courses everywhere. Uh, so there's, there's a great deal of overlap, according, such as that frog sciatic nerve um, muscle experiment that I was talking about. So alternatives have been developed for those particular experiments and they're out there and they're pretty easy to find. So unfortunately in entomology, it's, it's, it's not like that. It's a lot um, of a more of a niche discipline and uh, there are far fewer alternatives that have been developed sadly. So it is gonna be harder, but those would be the ways that would be suggested. Great, thank you. Uh, got a question from Janelle. Yeah, uh, well, um, great to hear someone uh, from Australia. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, I have serious and non-serious answers to that. I'll, I'll give the non-serious answer first. Um, when I was a veterinary student, I was very keen to go and visit pig farms as part of our clinical rotations. And I was told by the pig lecturer that unfortunately I would not be able to visit the pig farm. and. I said, oh, well, any other students unable to, to go and visit the pig farm? And I was told, no, unfortunately, it's just you, Andrew. I said, oh, really? And I thought about that for a while. And I said, well, can, well, can you tell me why? And I said, yes, unfortunately, the pig farms have said that you specifically cannot come <laughs> uh, because, because I had such a reputation of being an animal rights activist at the time. They were pretty worried that I would emerge with all sorts of photographs, expose them in the mass media, and it would do the industry no favours whatsoever. So... I was actually banned from, from going to any pig farms. So I guess the non-serious answer is uh, you can get yourself banned by being notorious. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and indeed, um, when the time came to go and see abattoirs, um, I was told, oh, Andrew, you know, just for your year, we're making the abattoir experience optional. And I thought about that for a bit and said, oh, well, that's great, but you know what, I'd really like to go anyway. <laughs> um, because I wanted to see what was going on. And so they said, well, you don't need to go for two weeks, just one week then. In fact, you don't need to go for one week. You can just do it in two days. And when my friend and I, who was, my friend was the other person who wanted alternatives, we went to this abattoir and the, the, um, the veterinarian there, the public health veterinarian who oversaw the meat inspection said, you know what, I think we can rush through everything in one single day. Um, but he didn't take his eyes off us one moment. And I was carrying around this, this camera, I'm afraid, in uh, a little uh, bum bag. And I was just waiting for an opportunity to take it out and photograph things. Uh, and sadly, I didn't get the opportunity but, but I, because he didn't take his eyes off me once. Um, but I nevertheless saw a series of things in this abattoir uh, which were really quite amazing uh, in a um, <clears throat> pretty horrible kind of way, to be honest. Um, just things you wouldn't expect to see, such as uh, workers in the lunchroom uh, eating their lunches like everything's completely normal but completely covered in spattered blood um, and, and many other things as well. And, and I'm very glad that I did go and I encourage others who have this opportunity to also go if they can so that they too can collect their own series of stories of things they've seen with their own eyes um, so that they can then tell other people because I think that's really important. Um, if people want as a society to have avatars, I think we should know what's going on inside them. So that's kind of the less serious answer. The, the more serious answer is that you have to look at the range of procedures that you're being asked to participate in. Uh, and there's a, there's a continuum. There's the most serious procedures where you're being asked to directly harm and kill animals uh, for your education. And then there's the, sort of the other thing when you have to go to uh, farms and procedures have been done to animals in the course of normal farm husbandry and you're, you're simply being asked to observe. So it's not directly for your education and you're not involved in it. And then somewhere in the middle are procedures where it's more being done for you and less for some other reason or the level of harm is more serious or you're not observing, you're actually starting to participate. 
Um, what I encourage people to do is look at the range of procedures. Don't decide to just tackle everything at once because you'll spread yourself too thin. You'll end up getting failed out of the veterinary course. You won't achieve anything good in terms of any positive changes. And you also won't get a veterinary degree and be able to go on and become a powerful animal advocate. I encourage people to actually prioritise these and to only tackle the issues that are most serious and also the ones where you think you have a realistic chance of winning. If people are thinking of taking on something which, which could actually get them failed out of the course, I do encourage them to think about that really seriously because there is the potential to go on and become a very powerful animal advocate for the rest of your uh, working life. And it's not something you should give up without very good reason. So I'd say, you know, I don't have a clear answer necessarily. Uh, perhaps, you know, you could talk to me about specific circumstances later on if you wanted. But in general, that's a strategy. I ask people to look at the range of issues, think about those things, prioritise them, be aware of the dangers of spreading yourself too thin and taking on everything. Um, and also the consequences of, of potentially getting failed out of the course. Um, in my case, I looked at the range of issues I had. I tackled the ones that were most serious. Um, I didn't think I had a chance of winning, but I no longer wanted to be in the course because I was so horrified by it all. Um, paradoxically, that meant I had no fear. There was nothing holding me back. And paradoxically, that meant that I actually won uh, what I was campaigning for because I pushed very hard. Um, but the people after me then took on the next most serious things and the people after them took on the next most serious issues. And over a period of time, we've reformed the veterinary course and it's become an awful lot more humane. And um, I'm glad to hear that the, the, the picture you just described to me, I think, is probably better than it used to be at Queensland. And indeed, you, you saw me talk about uh, Dr Brownie Dixon, who graduated from Queensland some years ago, and I believe she was the first student to be allowed to learn surgery about harming animals um, at the university and has been involved in various other alternatives there. So there you go, long answer, sorry about that. I hope that's been helpful. Yeah, it's a tough environment, that's for sure. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't give a bit of my presentation talking about the disturbing effects on veterinary students who uh, are in this environment for uh, five years or so and what it does to uh, survey results of veterinary students about their attitudes towards animal welfare, for example, and the implications of that as they go on to be animal carers. And likewise, the implications for people doing laboratory animal technician courses and going on to be uh, animal carers and things like that. But anyway, no time to discuss interesting areas. Sorry. What's the well, next, uh, uh, next question? Oh, we got, yeah. A couple of questions to wrap up. Uh, so James was a quick one just asking, what is the name of the relevant legislation in the UK called? Um, there is the Animals in Scientific Procedures Act, which has been updated when the uh, European Directive on uh, Laboratory Animal Use uh, was um, had to be transposed into all national legislation by, I think it was 2012. Um, so that was Directive 21063 EU. Uh, the British uh, legislation did not need to be updated very much because it was already in compliance with most of the new European directive, but there were some small changes. So that's the Animals and Scientific Procedures Act. Great. Um, and then we've got one last question by Chantel. Hi there. Hi, Andrew. Um, nice to meet you again. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm at the RBC um, in London, um, and part of our second year we have, um, we do di a dissection of the dog, um, and this is split between four people, um, but they all, when I asked their origin, the, our anatomy, um, head of anatomy said, oh, they come from the US, from the kill shelters, because nowhere in the UK, or none of the big, um, like, dogs' homes, um, will send their bodies to the RBC um, and other, I think other universities have this as well. So they have to buy the dogs and get them shipped over from the US rather than using, I'm sure Battersea has a lot of dogs that aren't always well where they could just donate. I don't, I, I don't know, I find it kind of counterproductive and quite frustrating um, that they can't use what's here. I mean, apart from the like economical costs like on the environment, having to ship them over as well. Um, 
And when I tried to say this, they said, oh, we don't want the risk of the media um, and animal rights, animal activists twisting the truth and saying, oh, well, they're putting down their animals to send to the UK vet colleges, basically. Yeah. So this is um, a common uh, issue in veterinary schools. It's uh, the killing of dogs in, um, well, usually from the greyhound racing industry, uh, actually, um, when they're not racing fast enough to make a profit, and sometimes also from uh, kill animal shelters as well because of pet overpopulation. And the argument is that um, <clears throat> if they're going to die, they might as well, you know, their body bodies might as well be, be used. Um, and when this comes to light, it typically causes a public scandal. Uh, this certainly has occurred in the UK with the killing of, of greyhounds and their use uh, by RV, RVC students um, in the past. So that's why, of course, uh, they don't want to source their dogs from uh, either the British greyhound racing industry or from uh, British shelters. So they're obviously obtaining them from foreign shelters. So uh, from a campaigning perspective, the thing to do would be to make the uh, American organisations in that area provide them with, with things like footage of um, the fate of those dogs. Um, from a, a, the perspective of somebody over here in the RVC, um, the, thing, the thing I would recommend would be encouraging the RVC to set up an ethically sourced cadaver program, which is like a um, body donation program in, um, in hospitals to um, source cadavers for use by medical students in medical schools. So, ethically sourced cadaver programs exist. Last time I checked was some years ago and they existed in nine uh, US veterinary schools. We had them in several Australian veterinary schools by then, uh, whereby uh, animals coming into the veterinary teaching hospital and even partner private uh, veterinary clinics as well sometimes, where those animals have been euthanized for medical reasons. Once that decision's already been made and can't, can't then be influenced, the decision to euthanize the animal, then the option of body disposal is presented whereby the, the client, if they wish, can choose to um, donate the, the body for teaching purposes. From the veterinary student perspective, the students at Tufts, they've had the, the oldest body donation program. It, it supplies all of their animals for teaching veterinary anatomy, uh, clinical procedures and surgical training. Uh, it's quite a large body donation program. Uh, they, they not only get the, the bodies, but they also get the clinical histories that come with them. They get a variety of pathological states as well as normal states, and they get a variety of different size breeds versus what we had when I was a student, a situation just like yours, except we all had greyhounds. Greyhounds are all relatively healthy. They're all the same breed. They're all the same size. They have no clinical history. So it's a much better teaching experience, actually. And the students also treated the bodies with much more respect because they had been a loved companion in a family somewhere. So um, all sorts of benefits from doing that. So how to actually encourage uh, veterinary schools to set up these body donation programs? Um, I've got information about that on the website humanelearning.info. There is a section. Uh, there was a very long report prepared uh, for veterinary schools on covering issues such as uh, embalming procedures, client consent forms, um, committees and processes within vet schools that should be established and consulted whilst setting these up and so on, which wasn't prepared by me, it's prepared by some other wonderful people, but it's since been used in some other veterinary schools. So that information is there along with some examples of vet schools I think that have done this, uh, which is out of date now, there would be more now. Um, and I, I guess I'd encourage people if they've got the time to, to you know, look into that and see whether they can probably get together, maybe not just on their own, but with others to, to try to get that kind of thing introduced as an alternative to, to you know, sourcing animals from kill shelters for one reason, because that's not sustainable, because if, if that information comes to light in the points of origin and causes the kind of public scandal that has repeatedly occurred wherever this has come to light, then the usual outcome is that those sources stop supplying their dogs. So it's not necessarily a reliable source for a veterinary school. So from that perspective alone, they should be interested in a re more reliable alternative, I would argue. And the Tufts, the Tufts example shows that it is possible to get enough cadavers for all of the anatomy needs, all of the clinical um, procedure needs and all of the surgical training needs. So did you say T-U-F-F-P-S? Tufts, yeah. So Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine, T-U-F-T-S, Tufts, yeah.
Thank you very much. Appreciate and it. And Dr. Kumar set up their program. I think he has a publication on it and there should be information here at humanelearning.info on this issue. Um, if you can't find it, um, contact me through my own website and I'll figure it out. Thank you. And what country is that vet school? The, the, that's, that's the US. The US. Yeah, and it's one of the top US veterinary schools. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great. Right. Um, so just to round off, there was uh, one request on, do you recommend any places for reading up on the psychological effects on vet students? Yeah, um, it, it basically it's, it's in some of my publications. Um, I have, there's a series of studies by uh, Self and colleagues. There's, there's an author called Self, S-E-L-F uh, and colleagues. And there's been work done by others. And I've brought this together in a few paragraphs and summarized it in my own publications. And I'm just wondering which of those would be the most helpful. Um, possibly, uh, the paper that I have on conscientious objection by students and the legal basis to support students and how universities should handle this issue um, and the steps that they should follow. Now, that, that paper is probably on this website as well. Another place, please, folks, is if you just look at my own website, andrewknight.info, click on articles, click on educational animal use, you'll very easily find this particular paper and others on animals and education. So my own website articles, I think it's educational animal use. There's a section on conscientious objection. I think it's in there. If you can't find it, then um, contact me through my website and I'm happy to uh, direct anyone to that. Excellent. Um, so I've just put the link to your website in the chat. Um, and I just want to say thank you very much because this is by far one of the most interesting things that I'd never really think to myself attend. Um, I also want to thank everyone else for coming as well and for, for hosting this, Andrew. Um, if there's anything else you want to round up on, on this stream of solidarity, um, feel free now. Um, I would just uh, say a massive uh, thank you to everyone for turning up on, on a, what is it, a Friday night. Normally people would be off hopefully enjoying themselves. Uh, of course, we're all locked down at such a strange time. But um, nevertheless, um, I'm delighted that so many people turn up, turn up to this and it's uh, great to have people interested in this topic um, it's because of the efforts of students who are interested and others that have supported them that we've really changed this issue in the last um, couple of, of decades, actually, uh, since I was involved. There's been an absolute sea change in uh, the harmful use of animals in courses uh, across Australia, North America, uh, and probably European countries as well. Harmful animal use still continues, but it's only a small fraction of what it used to be and it's, it's basically people like you guys that are interested in the issue and have uh, run campaigns intelligently and successfully that have, have, have made that change happen. Um, anyway, thanks for turning up. Have a great uh, weekend, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and just let anyone know there's, there's other different talks that we're putting on during the next coming weeks whilst everyone's stuck inside. Um, so feel free to come along to those. There's some interesting ones coming up. Um, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks.